deem paid credit. Now we have two possibilities. One was this individual, let's say, owning a company uh, in country A, and the other possibility is a corporation which owns a subsidiary in country A. Now, we have been talking so far only about tax that country A imposes on either the individual or X. We have not yet been talking about tax that country A or any other country imposes directly on Y. We use these two terms, direct and indirect, to refer to, uh, again, a, a, where X has an item of income and there is a country A uh, tax, that's a direct tax. <coughs> and when I say direct, I say direct because X, or similarly the individual over here, they are legally the taxpayer. Now we're looking at why. Why files a tax return in country A? Why pays a hundred of tax to country A? Now, if X owns Y a hundred percent, or if our individual owns Y a hundred percent, is there any difference economically? economically with whether a tax is direct to the individual or X, or whether it's a tax at the Y level and therefore an indirect tax uh, on whatever income uh, Y has, so indirect. So are you saying indirect is if country A taxes Y? Yeah. Yeah, country A taxes Y. Y, will say, is resident in country A and is a taxpayer there, files a tax return, and pays tax, of course, to country A. Now, that is an indirect tax with respect to X. My question, though, was, Ignoring tax rules, just economically. Economically, the effect on the individual or on X, is there any economic difference whether a tax is a direct tax where the US person is the legal taxpayer or uh, where Y is the taxpayer? Is there any economic difference? Okay, I see, uh, Darcy? Yeah, wow. I see your head going like this. <laughs> well, just ignoring tax rates and credits and everything else like that, I would say no. That it feels like the answer is no. There's no difference between those. Effects. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And this sort of gets back to uh, something we said you know, earlier, uh, not tonight, but uh, last week. All of this monkey business with boxes and that certain activities are within one legal entity versus another legal entity or individual or what have you. All of these boxes are fictions. I sort of go back to something early in the class you said though. I mean, is the, is the objective of global economy that there's some sort of general e equality among tax rates or is, is it every is it every woman for herself kind of as a country you know like do we have a sense if for except you know accepting North Korea and China and maybe people that we don't have a, you know those certain kind of grades is there sort of a sense in your own practice that all of these rules competing rules a 
the sense that we want to come out to sort of the equilibrium that produces good trade and good economic development. Can you frame that? Uh, yeah, uh, no, I can very definitely uh, speak to that. Uh, I mean, first of all, that's a that's a good question. Is there, you know, some sort of organization, so to speak, that uh, not organization in the sense of uh, a body, but just sort of is there a mentality that causes countries to do certain things? And the answer is that uh, no, there really isn't. It's pretty much everybody is out there for themselves. Now, having said that. Partly because of that, uh, things got so bad uh, with respect to profit shifting and large corporations uh, paying relatively little tax anywhere uh, on a lot of their income, uh, that uh, by 2012, uh, a number of countries, in a sense, forced some political will and through the G20 and then the OECD, uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the base erosion and profit shifting project was born. And uh, many countries got involved and more countries are involved today. Uh, trying to seek solutions that make it more difficult for major corporations to have income that is either taxed very low or you know, through artificial means or not taxed at all. Now, when I say that it's still true, though, that countries act in their own interest, uh, despite a lot of the very August language uh, that came out of that project, uh, we still see many countries that, uh, in a sense, have policies that, uh, I guess the expression would be, uh, that beggar their neighbors. So, for example, uh, a Luxembourg that, uh, that allows <coughs> allows non-taxation of, you know, a major amount of money earned by McDonald's, which is taking the position that it's not taxable in the United States, but at the same time telling Luxembourg that it should be taxable in the United States under the tax code, <coughs> and therefore shouldn't be taxable in Luxembourg. I mean, the activities of Luxembourg, the activities of Ireland, uh, they, in a sense, reduce the ability of other countries to, in fact, collect reasonable amounts. And if I remember correctly from one of the slides I showed you on uh, last Tuesday, it's estimated that for every dollar of tax paid, to a tax haven or other low tax country like this, uh, $5 is not paid in the other countries where they're actually conducting operations and earning income. Uh, now, the US, you know, is the U does the US wear a white hat? No. Not necessarily. Uh, the US is considered by many to be a secrecy jurisdiction because it's so easy to uh, form an LLC uh, and not uh, disclose, you know, who really owns it. Now, I think the first thing I'd like to do is look at these uh, two pictures. And again, right now we're looking at a big picture thing that uh, where there are some conceptual things that uh, are very helpful to your, your background. You know, we've talked a bunch about the fact that double taxation is, gee, something to be avoided, and the foreign tax credit mechanism uh, helps you avoid, uh, avoid uh, double taxation. But, uh, when we get into the deep credit, we have to look at another aspect. 
Now notice on the left, uh, we have an individual who owns a foreign company. And on the right, we have an individual at the top that owns acts the U.S. company. And that UX, U.S. company X owns Y, uh, a foreign company. Now, in both examples, uh, just to throw some numbers in there, uh, Y is uh, subject to a 25% tax rate in country A. Uh, y, if it uh, pays a dividend, uh, is taxed at, uh, the dividend is taxed uh, uh, on a 10% withholding tax basis. Now, if we look at A, uh, A is, uh, uh, A is going to someday receive a dividend, and if, uh, if there's a 25% tax at the Y level and a 10% tax on the, on the dividend, then that's going to leave A with a cash receipt of uh, 67 and a half. So 100 of income minus 25 of tax uh, gives 75 of earnings. Uh, and then when those 75 of earnings are paid as a dividend, Y is going to receive in cash uh, 67 and a half and uh, the remainder uh, goes off as a withholding tax to the government of uh, country B, uh, the other country, the foreign country. Now, how is A going to be taxed in the U.S. on that dividend? Any ideas? You look like, it's, yeah, first you raise your hand, then you scratch your head. <laughs> there was something with the change of law, and now they're not taxed on the dividend. They own a certain portion, 80%, is that? Don't think so. No. Anybody else? Well, is 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 uh, is dividend income normally income? Yes. Well, two forty five a hundred percent dividend received deduction. Okay, good point. But what does it say about who gets that hundred percent uh, dividend received? Ten percent or more owned foreign corporation. Okay, but which taxpayer does it apply to? <laughs> You no, you're lo you're looking at your notes. I want you to look at the code. Do you have the code? Anybody have the code here? Of course I do. <clears throat> what does the code say about who gets that hundred percent? Yes. Uh, it's corporations. It's corporations only. Okay, and this is this is. I'm glad you brought up the uh, this because. Uh, this is an important conceptual difference and exa is exactly what I'm trying to get at here. A is going to include that dividend in his own taxable income. Taxable at up to 37%. Yeah, plus 3.8% for the net investment income and so on. Now, yes, in some cases, that dividend might get special treatment uh, as a qualified dividend uh, subject to a lower tax rate. For those of you who want to look at the code language, which is really terrible, it's section 1H, section 1H. But that's just the rate at which it's taxed, whether it's taxed at maybe zero or 15 or 20 or 25 or whatever, uh, or 37. Uh, A is subject, to, is includes that dividend in income and is taxed on. Now, the deemed paid credit 
and this 245A that you were just referring to, uh, the 100% dividend received deduction for corporate uh, shareholders, certain corporate shareholders. Those, those things, Dean paid credit and the 100% dividend received deductions, those apply over on the right where X is a U.S. corporation owning Y, but they do not apply to A over here who's an individual. Why should an individual be treated worse than a corporate owner? Any ideas? You feel discriminated against because corporations are treated better? Well, to some extent, there's a presumption that the corporation is going to distribute that somewhere else along the line. Yeah, that's a perfect comment. There's an, there's an assumption that what is in corporate solution will eventually be distributed to an individual, you know, live person at some point in the future. We have what's called a classical tax system in the United States which means that what's in corporate solution and what the individual owns in terms of the corporation are, there's two separate taxes, one at the corporate level, one at the individual level. So whether, you know, if you're looking at a multiple corporations, if you look to your consolidated return rules, you see that, gee, all of them come together almost as if they're one taxpayer. Within corporate solution, you find a lot of provisions for dividend received deductions, for consolidation. Uh, things can move around within corporations because as long as they're in within corporations, there's one level of tax at the corporate level. When, uh, so for example, if income is earned within one corporation and it's distributed to another corporation, then generally, uh, if there's enough ownership, uh, and again, I think 243 is uh, the one for domestic situation, section 243, uh, Generally, you'll find that dividends are paid, uh, assuming there's enough, the requirements are met for ownership percentage and so on. Uh, there will not be double taxation uh, of U.S. tax within that, uh, within that corporate solution. But when you get to the individual, under this classical system we have, he's a separate a uh, taxpayer. Uh, he's, uh, he's considered another layer and there will be full taxation at the corporate level, full taxation at the individual shareholder level. Classical tax system. Okay, are there other systems? Yes. Uh, some countries will have some sort of imputational system or some other mechanism that will integrate the tax at the corporate level and at the individual level. Uh, we don't need to go into any details on those things at this point. Just understand that there are other systems out there. The U.S., though, is classical in the sense that, again, two levels of taxation. So if this is the case, the individual is not getting any direct foreign tax credit benefit from taxes that are paid by Y. On the other hand, X over there, which is a corporate shareholder of Y, can get this foreign tax credit benefit. Now, I think one of the things we said uh, last week, uh, I'm sorry, I maybe said on Tuesday, uh, was that the taxes that X pays, for the foreign taxes that X pays, are direct taxes. The taxes that Y paid with respect to X's claim of a foreign tax credit, 
the taxes that Y pays are indirect credits, and this is the subject of the Dean paid credit. Now, uh, in this example where there's a 25% tax rate on the income of Y and a uh, dividend withholding tax on the uh, the uh, uh, the dividend, let's say, that Y pays to X, and let's assume the amounts are, you know, because there's a hundred of income and uh, all available you know, earnings are distributed back as a dividend. Uh, in the case of Y uh, and X, how much is the direct tax in the hands of X? How much is the indirect tax in the case, uh, with respect to uh, X? This concept of what's direct and what is indirect is very important. Okay, you're asking a question. You're saying, is 7.5 the direct tax? Now, you happen to be right, but why is it right? Uh, X is an actual taxpayer for the 7.5 tax, and Y actually pay for the 25. Yeah. Even though Y may physically pay the tax to the government of the foreign country, the legal obligation, and remember we talked on Tuesday, you know, some about, you know, who's the uh, taxpayer, primary rule, who has the legal obligation on the tax. X is the legal one that's paying the tax, even though the physical payment may be made by Y. And what about the 25? Who's the legal taxpayer? Uh, this, is, this is section 960. And this is the one that's, that's saying that such domestic corporation, X, shall be deemed to have paid so much of such foreign corporations foreign income taxes as are properly attributable to such item of income. Now, the direct, that 25 is a direct tax on Y. Section 960 allows the, uh, allows X to treat this, uh, this tax as, uh, uh, to deem that it has paid that tax and is able to claim a credit. Now, again, notice it says at the start, if there is included in the gross income of a domestic corporation under any item of income, it does not say in the income of any domestic taxpayer. It says domestic corporation. An individual is not allowed this deemed paid tax credit for indirect taxes. Uh, any questions on this, this conceptual issue of individual versus uh, corporation at the US shareholder level? Because this is an important one to, uh, to recognize. Now, I'm going to make a slight aside we talked some last week about uh, the entity classification rules and disregarded entities. Let's say that Y, because of an election, is treated as a disregarded entity with respect to A, the individual owner. What does that do to our discussion regarding foreign tax credits and A's ability or inability to claim any foreign tax credits for that 25 that was paid by uh, Y? Right, for US tax purposes, if I, heard, uh, if I heard you correctly, for US tax purposes, Y now no longer exists. 
whatever assets, whatever income, whatever expenses, all of those are considered for tax purposes as being owned or earned or paid by A. Now, if A is considered to be the payer under this fiction of the disregarded entity, if A is considered to be the payer, is that 25 a direct or an indirect tax? Yeah, it becomes a, di a direct tax so that A can now claim a foreign tax credit. Now, if you're looking at, you know, for example, individual clients that are, you know, conducting some sort of business in another country, this disregarded entity status uh, can make a big, big difference to the overall effective tax rate. Now, ignoring the qualified dividend, uh, you know, lower rates uh, in Section 1H, ignoring those, if you have a situation like Y here where, uh, uh, I'm sorry, where A owns Y and uh, uh, let's say that A has received this dividend of 75, uh, the amount of, yeah, in fact, that's an interesting question. How much is the amount of the dividend? Uh, if Y pays A 67.5 uh, in cash, and of course Y pays uh, the difference, uh, which is, uh, what, seven and a half, off to, uh, uh, off to uh, the local government as withholding tax, how much does A include in his income as a dividend? Uh, as, uh, now, right now, we're assuming not a disregarded entity status. We're assuming not disregarded entity. So how much does A include as a dividend? Is it 75? Or is it 67 and a half? Would you claim the 75 and then get the credits back? Okay, that's the right answer, but why is that the right answer? 75 is the income, but why, I mean, where do we, uh, why isn't it 67.5 or some other number? What do we look at in terms of a document which we can look at and say, gee, 75 is the right number. Because don't you want the credit to be figured on the full amount of the 75? You're looking to the result. I'm getting more basic. You know, how do you know that 75 is the amount of the dividend? Is there some paperwork somewhere that uh, causes, uh, you know, you to know that the dividend is 75? What, how does a corporation, in fact, make a dividend? You know, do the board of directors have to do something? Yeah, declare the, yeah, declare the dividend. And is there paperwork? I mean, do, do they just, you know, do it verbally and never record anything? Pardon? They need a resolution. They need a resolution, and probably somebody keeps a copy of it. Yeah, secretary of the company. Okay, so there's an actual piece of paper somewhere, or at least an entry in a computer somewhere, which indicates that there has been a dividend of 75. Now, yes, 10% of that 75 or 7.5 has to go off to the government as withholding tax because the recipient is the taxpayer under local law and it, the 75 is A's income. So uh, A has, uh, okay, so A has 75 of income, and uh, assuming we are looking 
let, let's put together the 37% and the 3.8 and so on. And let's just say that adds up to about 40, uh, to use rough numbers. 40% uh, of 75 is roughly what, about 30? Okay, so uh, A has a tax obligation of 30 on that 75 of dividend minus, of course, the foreign tax credit of how much? How much is the foreign tax credit? Seven and a half. Okay, he gets the seven and a half because the seven and a half is a direct tax with respect to A. The 25 is an indirect tax, and as we've said conceptually before, individuals don't get the benefit of indirect taxes. So if we look at A's, in a sense, economic, economic total tax, uh, total tax cost on 100 of income at the Y level, there was 25 of economic tax cost at the Y level. And we're saying that there was 30 minus 7.5 of foreign tax credit, so 22.5, roughly, at, a, at A's level of U.S. tax. And if I add together 25 and 22.5 and plus the 7.5 of withholding tax, I get a total of 55 of tax on 100 of income earned at the Y level. Now, does that sound like a, uh, an efficient way to, you know, to have uh, earnings in a foreign country and to bring them back home? No, it's not so efficient. Now, what would be the answer if we check the box on Y and we now have a disregarded entity? If we have a disregarded entity, how much is A's income? Is it still 75 or is it something else? 100, okay, why is it 100? This is a disregarded entity, so all income from him will be attributed to A. Yeah, the income, the expenses, the, the assets, I mean, whatever it is, is in his name. So just as you would if you were calculating, uh, you know, your business being conducted, you know, here in Seattle, you would uh, calculate income and expenses and the net income of that business before tax is 100. Now, what we said his tax rate, let's say, is 37. Well, oh, gee, is that, uh, in, is that investment income uh, uh, 3.8 percent applicable or not? To be honest with you, I'm not sure whether it is or not, but I, my guess is that with the disregarded entity, it's an actual business, and uh, maybe it's not applicable. But uh, I, I stand uh, in some amount of ignorance on that one. So let's say that A is subject to tax 37 on that 100. Okay, what about now that 25 as well as the 7.5? What about that 25? Can he now claim a foreign tax credit? Yeah, with the disregarded entity, it is his tax. It is now a direct tax in calculating his, uh, his uh, foreign tax credit. So as a result, uh, he ends up with a with 37 minus, uh, yeah, 37 minus uh, the uh, total taxes paid to country A, uh, country A as opposed to country B, which I think I said before, uh, uh, of 32 and a half. So he pays around five to the US government and his maximum tax is 37. Where did the 32 and a half come from? 
32 and a half is the 25, uh, which was the corporate level tax uh, in country A on Y, plus 10% of 75, which is the dividend withholding tax. The two together add the 32 and a half. And that would still apply even if Y was disregarded? Well, the Y taxes are under Y's law. Under Y's law, Y is a real legal entity. Oh. It is only the fiction of the U.S. rule which says you can ignore the box that is around Y. This is why, you know, last week I tried to, you know, say something about reality versus fiction. Why is reality? There really is a legal entity there. It's been formed and under uh, country A law. It's you know been properly established and whatever their local governmental uh, authorities have uh, allowed the creation under you know whatever local company's law or you know applicable LLC law or something. Uh, in that country, the tax authorities in country Y, they apply their own law. The fact that there's something which has been elected under the 7701 rules for entity classification doesn't matter at all with respect to the country Y tax authorities or application of its law. So this is, you know, this is uh, the way it is. So we've, uh, by looking at A and making that disregarded entity election for, uh, for Y, we've reduced Y's, uh, I'm sorry, we've reduced A's U.S. tax uh, from uh, whatever we had said it was before down to essentially a maximum of 37. Now, again, we had a question mark as to, uh, as to whether uh, the net investment income rules uh, were affected, but I, my, my guess is that uh, probably that doesn't apply, so he saves another 3.8%. Okay, the the next area that uh, I'll, or the next part of this that I'll speak about just a, a little bit, and then I think we'll get more into it when we're uh, doing subpart F next week, and uh, maybe the guilty rules. I think the uh, the week after that is that with respect to A and its ownership of his ownership of Y. The important timing things as to when things happen is when Y pays a you know a, a dividend. Uh, that's the usual case, not always, but let's say the usual case. With respect to X owning Y, up through 2017, under the old deferral system that we've occasionally talked about, usually the important timing was the payment of a dividend. In other words, when a dividend is paid would be when X recognizes income from a dividend and uh, the question of a deemed paid tax credit uh, comes up. Since 2018, things have changed. Uh, Jennifer here had referred to the 245 uh, cap A uh, uh, dividend received deduction, which we noted only applies to domestic corporations. Now, in the case of X, all other things being equal, normally that means that if Y pays a dividend, that dividend, okay, will come in, let's say, at 75, but then there's a deduction for 75, 
and we end up with zero. And there's also rules in there, which we'll eventually talk about, uh, I guess, probably week after next, that disallows any foreign tax credit for that seven and a half uh, uh, of the uh, uh, dividend received, I'm sorry, of the uh, withholding tax, uh, and certainly no deemed paid credit uh, with respect to that. Because the logic is if if there's no taxation on the dividend at all, why should there be any allowance of a foreign tax credit? Okay. So with respect to X, the payment of a dividend will normally no longer be an important event. Now, there are some potential exceptions, but uh, this is the, uh, the usual, uh, usual thing. Uh, now, why are we still talking about deemed paid tax credits with respect to corporations if an actual dividend is now a non-issue because of 245A? Now, I've made reference to the subpart F rules and the guilty rules. Uh, global intangible low taxed income rules. That's respectively sections 951 and section 951 cap A. Those are the rules which can cause X and also A, these rules apply to both uh, individual and corporate shareholders, that can cause certain amounts of income or categories of income earned by Y to be treated as if a dividend had been paid. And you may recall I said that in Congress in its wisdom uh, in enacting the Tax Cuts and Job Acts, uh, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, pretty much used a sledgehammer or a baseball bat to Try to uh, try to take back some of the incentive to just continue pouring more and more uh, uh, profits through profit shifting into uh, foreign companies. So, because of that sledgehammer or baseball bat, there is going to be on a yearly basis some amount of income, a lot of it under this section 951 cap A, which is the guilty rules, there will be a continuation of income recognized by X or by A on the certain, let's call it, excess earnings which are uh, within Y. If Y earns, you know, so to speak, too much money, the excess will be currently taxable in the hands of A. And again, uh, in the following couple of weeks, we'll be covering more of these details. But the point is that because that money is being currently recognized by X, foreign tax credits make a difference, and the deemed paid tax credits has become even more important with respect to this. Yes. So the the nine fifty one would apply to um, a the individual too. The nine fifty one and the nine fifty one cap A both of them apply both to individuals and to uh, corporate owners. So the income is the, the income effect. The, you know, uh, the taxable income effect, uh, no, let me not say taxable income effect. The, uh, the recognition of uh, gross income, you know, before expenses, the recognition of gross income within the taxable income computation of X and of A is essentially the same. But X gets certain benefits that A does not get. X gets a 
certain deduction, essentially 50% of, uh, uh, of the uh, amount of inclusion, which is why I mentioned uh, last, uh, either last week or Tuesday that the effective rate on this guilty is not 21%, but is 10.5%. Uh, and then in addition, uh, that 10.5% can be reduced by some amount of foreign tax credit. So there's a lot of benefits that X gets that reduces the actual US tax from 10.5% potentially down. Now, A over here does not get the deduction, does not get any foreign tax credits except to the extent that there's direct tax that he's paid. And that's seven and a half, that's a direct tax. So he'd get the special deduction equal to 50% just on the seven and a half? Not, not him. No, no, there are two different things. The special deduction, which we haven't talked about uh, other than to say that it's the mechanism that gets to this 10 and a half percent effective tax rate on guilty. That's section 250, for those of you who are marking that down in your notes. That is one item. Foreign tax credit is an entirely different item. Two different things. It's sort of like, uh, let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, X recognizes 100 of, uh, of gross income. X uh, uh, under the guilty rules. X would then get this special deduction you mentioned, which is 50, so he has a net of 50 in his taxable income. At 21%, that 50 would result in 10 and a half of tax. Then to the extent that Y has paid taxes or that uh, X has paid direct taxes with respect to that. There would be a foreign tax credit, again, reduced to the extent of the 50%, which is not taxed. Uh, again, I want to stay away fr from the too much of the complication. The, the, uh, I think the, the principal thing conceptually to get out of this is that uh, going forward, X is going to be most importantly calculating deemed paid credits on a year-to-year -year basis, either because of subpart F inclusions, which we're going to talk about next week, and guilty inclusions, which we will talk about uh, in the following week. Okay, one thing which... Uh, uh, which I think is uh, worth uh, spending a uh, minute or two on. There's an important conceptual issue, and that is uh, why is the indirect foreign tax credit there in the first place? I mean, why, uh, and you'll see when we spend a few minutes on the uh, foreign tax credit limitation and the basket rules, uh, you'll see that, uh, geez, this is a morass of, uh, of uh, pain and suffering for all concerned. Uh, you know, why is it there? Why conceptually is it there? Uh, now, we've, we've talked a, a bit about, uh, you know, what would happen if uh, the individual uh, in the prior slide had made the election for why to treat it as a disregarded entity. Uh, and uh, long prior to the uh, entity classification rules, uh, the changes that made uh, it so easy to have a disregarded entity, uh, and in fact, maybe this is an interesting point, that the entity classification rules were changed to what they are now in 97. 
the tax rules you know, have been around for 100 years. So uh, without going into detail on what was there before the current entity classification rules, let's just say it was more difficult <coughs> to create a disregarded entity. And as a result, you very, very, very seldom saw them. It was something you could do, but the pain and suffering of trying to create a disregarded entity meant that you just very seldom saw them. So as a result, uh, if uh, what you would see a lot of is a U.S. company would operate in another country, if it decided to do so, in branch form, not in uh, the form of, you know, of using a subsidiary. You know, if we draw our, uh, our usual picture, uh, you know, of X here. If X chose to operate in branch form, then it would be taxed differently, of course, than if X chose to conduct the exact same activities through Y. Because if it's in branch form, the legal taxpayer is X. X is the one that's earning revenues. X is the one that is paying expenses. X is the one that is paying taxes. Uh, just like if we uh, you know, made the election for a disregarded entity. So uh, this was, uh, this was uh, something that was common. Now, of course, it was also common that a lot of Xs would choose to operate, again, the same activities uh, in side a legal entity Y. And now Y is the earner of the revenues. Y is the one that's paying the expenses. Y is the payer of any taxes. Now, I think I may have mentioned uh, last week that one of the sort of religious things about good tax policy is that taxes should not uh, should not dictate how taxpayers choose to run their businesses. Maybe there's a better answer tax-wise in operating through a branch. But on the other hand, uh, gee, we kind of like the security of having the limited liability that using Y provides. Or maybe we're in a business which requires local licensing, and they will only grant these licenses to a locally formed company. So there can be all kinds of business reasons and legal reasons for why you choose to operate in the foreign country in one form or another. So the logic of the tax policy was, well, Taxes should not influence the decision. So if uh, th what this, uh, what this uh, example is meant to, uh, to show is if we operated through a branch, what would be the tax result? If we operated through Y and there were no indirect tax credit, uh, what would the answer be? And then thirdly, if there is an indirect foreign tax credit, what is the answer? And wow, it turns out that, of course, the uh, tax uh, in the case of a branch and the tax in case of there being an indirect foreign tax credit comes out the same. Whereas without the indirect tax credit, the tax ends up, of course, being much higher. Now, if you look at the economics of this, of this thing, what makes, what makes the tax higher 
if you're looking at that center column where there's no indirect foreign tax credit. What makes the tax higher? What economically is happening that causes a higher tax? Go ahead. Allowance of the indirect tax that was paid in the foreign country as a credit. Okay, and what's, uh, what happens where, uh, what happens in that center column though where that's not allowed? Why? Uh, They're only taking a 7.5 foreign tax credit instead of 21. Oh, right, uh, okay, but what economically is happening with the 25? What did we say, I, I guess uh, probably on Tuesday, with respect to the value of a credit versus a deduction? Credits rule, deductions drool. <laughs> did we say that? I must, that, that one's new to me. <laughs> you know, you, you are a, a poet, uh, patient. Okay, what else did we say about uh, deductions versus credits? How much is a credit worth? We said dollar for dollar. What is a deduction worth? 21%. Yeah, 21% uh, because our tax rate is 21%. So, you know, and if we look at that center column, uh, if we look at U.S. tax before foreign tax credit, line G, uh, you know, at 21%, if there's no foreign tax credit, then we're getting the effect of a deduction because our tax base is 75 as opposed to 100. We're getting the economic effect of a deduction which is only that 2.1 out of the, out of the uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, which is, uh, we're only getting the 21% of the, of the 25 as the, uh, the economic benefit. And of course, we're getting no credit. So we end up with this, you know, at the end of the day, we end up with this higher tax obligation. And you know, that's, uh, that's going to cause taxpayers, all other things being equal, to say, gee, I'm going to operate in branch form instead of as a corporation, even though there are commercial and legal, you know, reasons that I really should be using a, uh, a corporation in, uh, in uh, the foreign country. So in order to prevent uh, this kind of uh, benefit, you know, more beneficial result for one form of organization than another, we have the foreign tax credit mechanism uh, for indirect taxes, this deemed paid tax mechanism. That's why it's there. And notice the asterisk uh, in here that refers to the section 78 gross up. Uh, why, uh, uh, what is the Section 78 gross up? Anybody have any idea? Okay, uh, if we look at our, uh, our third column, uh, let's just say that uh, 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 let's say, uh, I'm trying to think of how to uh, how to cover this in the, the simplest fashion. Let's, let's pretend we're uh, before the, you know, the, uh, the new tax law effective from 2018 and that as a result, uh, we're looking at why paying an actual dividend to X which is taxable and which triggers a foreign tax credit. Uh, how much is the, uh, how much is the uh, amount of the dividend to, uh, to X uh, in this uh, third column. Is the amount of the dividend 100? Is the amount of the dividend 75? Is it some other number? What's the amount of the dividend? If you're the secretary of company Y and you're, you know, your uh, obligation is to record the declaration of a dividend, dividend uh, Oh you're, oh, you're looking at Section 78. Yeah, so how are we 
Okay, well, yeah, we're, we're talking about 78. Okay, read 78 again. Um, if domestic corp, blah, blah, an amount equal to the taxes deemed to be paid by such corporation, blah, blah, uh, for this are as a dividend received by such domestic corp from the foreign corp. Okay, so section 78 is saying that the amount of the taxes which are deemed paid will be treated as income to X. Okay, and what we're looking at right now is why is section 78 there? If we look at this third column, we said the net income within Y is 100. The amount of tax that Y pays is 25. The amount available for distribution, the earnings and profits, is 75. If you're the secretary of that company and the board of directors declares the maximum dividend that's available, how much is that dividend? 100 minus the 25 of taxes, 75. 75 is what's left. That's your earnings and profits. Now, earnings and profits is a US tax concept. Under local rules, it might be called retained earnings or statutory earnings or you know who knows what. And local companies law will uh, provide rules as to how much can be paid out. But again, for simplicity, we're assuming that, that you're, you acting as the secretary of the company dutifully record the declaration of a dividend of 75. And if that is the legal dividend, that is the dividend that X will record as income. Again, we're talking about years you know, prior to uh, uh, effectively, we're talking about years uh, 2017 and prior, but uh, the, basic, uh, the basic law doesn't change. So the dividend income at the X level is 75. Now, will these numbers work out right if we just calculate 21% of 75? No, they won't. The only way they work out right is if we increase the amount of income that X recognizes back to that 100. We can only get the numbers to work out the same way they would if there were a branch by adding that 25 of deemed paid tax back. And that's your section 78 gross up. A minor side, of course, uh, is the point that, gee, why is it? Why is section 78 in section 78? Why didn't they just say this in section 901? You know, which is your foreign tax credit rules. Well, again, if you go back to your table of contents, it'll make sense as to why section 78, section 78 rule is in section 78 because that's items that are specifically included in gross income. So again, there's some logic as to where these things are and what they say. <laughs>